Hello, everybody. Reporting to you again from the glamour city, Hollywood. So the way that <laughs> this is co-designed with the communities, right, where they needed to be able to afford medical care. And they said, and I've said, across the areas where we work, medical care that's free is less valued. So how do you make something valued and accessible to everyone? And how do you help people always see this powerful intersection between the health of the environment and the health of humans? The healthier the environment, the healthier humans and vice versa. And of course, these communities see this, but it's always nice to make it as visible as possible. And we're starting this now in Brazil as well, where people will be able to pay, can pay in those other two locations with non-cash payment options. Seedlings, which we use for reforestation. It's a very popular form of payment mm -hmm. and very, um, and people love it because they say, you know, I now, I you know today I'm choosing to pay with cash, but I know that if anything serious ever happens in my life, I'm going to be okay because mm -hmm. I'll always be able to pay for it. Interesting. And I'm, I won't have to cut down the rainforest to access care. Because one medical emergency can cost an entire year's income on average around the world. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content. And part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for a show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. I'm joined by Dr. Canary Webb, a founder of Health and Harmony. Welcome to the show today. Thank you so much, Scott. Honored to be here. Now, you have an interesting story. When you were an undergrad student, you studied orangutans at uh, Kunung Palung National Park in Indonesian Borneo. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that experience and how that became pivotal to what you're doing today in, with health and harmony. Yeah, so I was actually really jealous of a friend who kept getting all these awards. And I decided that the reason that she was getting these awards is because she was really focused on one thing. So I chose the craziest, wildest thing that I was <laughs> passionate about. Uh, and that was um, orangutans. And so I headed off to Borneo. Uh, it took me a while to get a position, but I got one. And I thought I was going to be a primatologist. And it was amazing. I mean, these rainforests are some of the most beautiful spaces on the earth. And I fell in love with the forest. I fell in love with the orangutans. And... I really began to see that no matter what I did with the orangutans and no matter how much I studied them, it was irrelevant because the forest was disappearing around me and it was heartbreaking. And I mean, we are talking giant, giant trees, like 22 stories tall. And when they fall, it's, it's just like, you know, maybe many thousands of years old. It's very hard to tell how old rainforest trees are. Um, because you can't count rings, but they're very old. And it just, um, it just broke my heart. And I thought, what would be the point of studying orangutans if there's no forest? They can't survive. And the predictions at that time were that orangutans would go extinct within my lifetime, even by now, actually. By next year, the predictions at that point were that they would all be gone. Thank goodness that is not what has happened. Um, but it didn't happen because a lot of people worked very concertedly on it. And for me, I just began to feel like I can't, uh, how can I just study orangutans and watch the forest disappear around me? But I didn't understand why it was disappearing. And so I spent time talking with the loggers who were people from the local communities. And they told me something that just rocked the foundation of my understanding of the world, which is that they were often logging to pay for health care. One man I know cut down 60 giant rainforest trees to pay for a, a C-section, right? That kind of 
horrible catch-22. And what everyone was telling me was that they valued the forest, they understood how important it was for their future uh, and for the health and well-being of the planet, but they didn't have a choice. So, and I understand if I was in that position, I wouldn't have a choice either. I had a C-section this year myself and I know my family would have done whatever it took to get that care for me. And I would have been grateful for it, even if it meant that life would be harder for my child, which is exactly this horrible trade-off that communities are making. So I decided to go to medical school. I founded a nonprofit called Health and Harmony to return and work together with communities. And then I began this long process um, together with my Indonesian colleagues of doing what we call radical listening, which means asking communities who are at the forefront of this destruction and who know what the solutions are. In many places in the world and in Indonesia as well, these communities are the absolute best possible protectors of the forest. They often also are in positions where that's difficult to do, but if they can be supported from the outside world, um, amazing magic can happen, which is what we found. You know, the thing is that these communities don't have resources because of a long history of colonialism. Resources have been taken from these communities and to the global North for hundreds and hundreds of years. And when we think about colonialism, we tend to think about it as something in the past, but really it's an ongoing process where resources continue to flow out of these communities. And so my belief is that we are, we are at, in, in this critical three crises on the planet right now, a climate crisis, a biodiversity crisis, and a justice crisis. And all of these have been building for a long time. And basically, if we don't address them, we're not going to survive as a human species. That's where we are. And they cannot be addressed in silos. They have to be addressed together. So that's what we do at Health and Army. We listen to the people who are the experts. I mean, that's part of colonialism, to not listen to people from the global south, not listen to people who have less education, who you know live in small communities. But they are the experts. So we well, ask them. So at the heart of what we're talking about are specifically the indigenous peoples and the local communities that are residing and living in symbiotic relationship with these rainforests. Uh, they are both the protectors, but you know, in the past, they have also been the ones that have been illegally logging, uh, to your point. There's a lot of contributing factors, like you mentioned before. Can you talk about their mindset? Uh, and again, recognizing that what happens in, let's say, Indonesia, Madagascar, Brazil, or, or certain parts of China, they're going to be all different because of culture and, and long history aspects. Exactly. But how do you get into the psyche of, of, of what they're doing and the decision-making process and be able to actually rechannel in a way that's healthier, that then supports you know, training for a more organic farm while su supporting and protecting the, the rainforest? Yeah, so the first thing I'll say is that the context is different everywhere in the world, just as you said, right? In, in the Amazon, indigenous and traditional communities are living in and off the forest and intensely protecting it. And sometimes, you know, making deals because they need access to healthcare or something like that. Um, and in, the, the, in Southeast Asia, it's a very different context yet again and different also in Africa. So how do we do it? we ask people. It's called radical listening. With love and respect, sitting in a circle and asking groups of people, what would you need as a thank you from the world community so that you could live in balance with your ecosystem and you could give this beautiful gift of protecting the forest to the world and that you can thrive more, right? How do we, so we ask that question and then we just sit there and listen. And what comes out in my experience everywhere in the world is that they, people come to a consensus decision. If we had these things, two or three things usually, we, everything would change, everything would get better. At our first site in Gunung Palung National Park, the communities asked for um, organic farming training and 
healthcare access. We did those things. 10 years later, there was a 90% drop in logging households. There was a stabilization of the loss of the primary forest. And in fact, 52,000 acres of rainforest grew back. That's 21,000 hectares. And there was a 67% drop in infant mortality. And if you compared the loss of forest at that part compared to other national parks, it was equivalent to $65 million in carbon. These communities are giving an enormous gift to the world. So it really works to just listen to communities and implement their solutions. And I'll just say one other thing, which is really interesting. When we do these consensus decision-making processes, we do it in lots and lots of communities and in a given ecosystem. And what we found is that every single group of people will independently come to the same conclusions about what the solutions are. So I really believe that this process is finding that right solution. Yeah, that's, that, that's interesting because, you know, you know, because of your background and research background as well, is that sometimes eliciting what is the true motivation, intent, and the solutions from people can be very tricky. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm kind of curious as to how do you actually um, you address some of the biasness that typically comes out from, let's say, market research. And this is something that, you know, even in a you know, very developed nation we have trouble with because what people say, what they want uh, to your face or in writing is oftentimes maybe different from their actual behavior. Uh, so I'm curious about kind of the methodology that goes into this, this listening process, consensus. Well, for one thing, it's not asking one person. I, I think when you ask one person, you're much more likely to get a like, well, what's in my benefit? What should I say? Right. <laughs> you know? But when you're doing it in a big group and everyone is kind of wrestling with each other where they're saying, well, that would, what about this? No, that's not really going to work because of this. Well, how about if it was like this? Well, that would, that would then work. Um, and, and my experience actually is that what they come to eat are the things that they are ready to do. Hmm. Some criticisms of this methodology are, well, well, there might be a better theoretical solution that the communities haven't heard of. And that might be true, although I'm amazed what people have heard of in the most remote communities in the world. You know, like, we want solar panels. I'm like, what? Do you guys even know solar panels exist? Okay. You know? Um, and um, they, you know, people, while they're wrestling with these solutions, they're coming to things that they are ready to do. And that's very different from imposing a decision from outside, even if it's a theoretically, in some sense, a better decision, although I very much doubt it. But if you're trying to convince people to do something, they're not going to do it. But like that organic farming training I told you about, it took me a while to find a, an expert in organic farming from the nearby island of Java. But when we did, but before we did, these communities, every time I was in any village, people would come up to me and say, why are we getting that organic farming training? We really want it, right? And sure enough, basically everyone showed up for these trainings. Mm. So that, it, it's like a, it's a behavioral science methodology of finding what people are already ready to do. And that saves an enormous amount of time and resources because there's no convincing anyone. Yeah, I think I like the way you frame that, uh, and it makes a perfect sense, really, because it's something that they had propensity to do anyways. I want to talk about something that's kind of unusual, which is there are different business models and business people that under the cover of biodiversity, protection of the rainforest, sustainability, are coming in and presenting interesting business models. Some may be you know, merited, others kind of questionable. Um, for those, for example, you know, benefiting from kind of instead of biodiversity, a singular type of a tree, for instance, uh, and arguing that it actually provides, you know, income source, labor, and that they're actually protecting the rainforest. When in fact, they're actually doing with, with biodiversity, maybe replacing with palm oil trees or something else for that matter. Others yep. are coming up with very elaborate system of paying them essentially to protect the, protect the forest. Uh, so I've seen a lot of interesting things, including billionaires that are literally purchasing hectares of forest 
uh, in the name of it's better to log it and reforest it than to just leave it to what it's currently happening. How do you deal with all these types of different things that's coming in and more specifically for the uh, you know, the IP, IPLCs, so the indigenous peoples in the local communities, how do they rationalize when they're presented with different offers? I mean, this is when I talk about the justice crisis, right? That there are so many people who are trying to uh, maximize their own personal profit through the climate crisis without really realizing that the systems that got us into this crisis in the first place are not gonna get us out. And colonial extractive methodologies are not gonna get us out of this crisis. Communities who know and value and honor their local ecosystems are the ones who know what the right solutions are. And those solutions need to be listened to. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you can well imagine you're in a community. I've, I've talked with communities who palm oil companies have come to them and said, you know, we want, you know, we're, we want you to sell us your land so that we can do palm oil. And, and they know that they will become, in the literal words these communities use, we will become slaves to them. Mm. But if we do not have access to healthcare, if we do not have access to our very basic living needs in our Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? What, what choice do they have? And yet, if you can ask them, well, what would you need so that you would have a choice? Communities know exactly immediately what those solutions are. And they want to protect ecosystems in their, in their fullness, in their, in their biodiversity, in their, you know, that's, there's, there's no better solution than indigenous and local community solutions. And that's not centralized. It's not valued in our world economy, but it must be if we're going to survive. There's an amazing woman that we get to work with in, in Brazil. Her name is Juma Shipaya. She's an activist, a medical student right at the moment, and also the leader of her indigenous community. And, and she says, if the indigenous communities have been listened to, we wouldn't be in this crisis now. Mm. And she's right. Excellent point. I want to talk about uh, this notion of their approach, right? So when we think about um, commerce, when we think about economics, we think in terms of fiat currencies. And of course, some sovereignties have chosen to accept cryptocurrencies. But there's an interesting approach where some of these health clinics that are serving thousands of patients, uh, local indigenous people, they're accepting alternative payments. And we're talking about things like tree seedlings, uh, maybe yep. skill sets, labor. Um, how does that work and why does it work? Yeah. So the way that <laughs> this is co-designed with the communities, right, where they needed to be able to afford medical care and they said, and it said, across the areas where we work, medical care that's free is less valued. So how do you make something valued and accessible to everyone? And how do you help people always see this powerful intersection between the health of the environment and the health of humans? The healthier the environment, the healthier humans and vice versa. And of course, these communities see this but it's always nice to make it as visible as possible. So that's what we do in our clinic uh, clinic in Indonesia and in Madagascar. And we're starting this now in Brazil as well, where people will be able to pay, can pay in those other two locations with non-cash payment options, seedlings, which we use for reforestation. And, and you might ask, well, how does that work economically? We can get as much money as we want for reforestation. That is like, there are, there's so much money out there for reforestation. There's very little money out there for healthcare. But we can, and if the patients are paying with seedlings, we can then buy the seedlings from the patients and effectively pay for their medicine. And so that's, that's it's a very popular form of payment mm -hmm. and very, um, and people love it because they say, you know, I now, I, you know, today I'm choosing to pay with cash, but I know that if anything serious ever happens in my life, I'm going to be okay. 
because mm. I'll always be able to pay for it. Interesting. And I'm, I won't have to cut down the rainforest to access care. Mm. Mm. Because one medical emergency can cost an entire year's income on average around the world. Yeah. Now, one of the things that's very important is tools, right? So when we think about trees and cutting down trees, you need a chainsaw. So can you tell us about chainsaw buyback program? How does that work? And is it working? And is it just localized areas that, that you guys are interacting with or, or you guys are able to make a larger impact in these larger rainforests? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, taking one chainsaw out of commission has an enormous impact. Right. So like, cause one person with one chainsaw can cut down vast areas of forest in a year. So basically we had, after um, this 10 year survey that I told you about where we had had this 90% drop in logging households, we're like, okay, so what about this 10% remaining? And we started to work with those individuals. And what we found is they were an unusual group of people who hadn't been able to easily switch to the organic farming that the majority of people said was a good alternative. The reason they couldn't was usually because they didn't own very much land. They didn't own agricultural land, which is rare in that region, but um, wasn't the case in some people. They often owned their chainsaw, so they had a big investment in logging. Um, and often these were men who had been logging since they were like 12, 13, 14 years old. They had very minimal educations and they just kind of didn't feel like they knew what and how, what else to do. Mm. So um, with the communities, this idea of a chainsaw buyback program was designed. So they um, would, so the husband, who was usually the logger and his wife, would start one or two businesses. And the startup capital for that business would be provided partly by them giving us their chainsaw, which we would buy. And then we would also give basically some angel investing to them. And then to get, we would jointly own the businesses until uh, they paid back our investment. If the businesses went defunct, we would lose our money. So it wasn't, there's a real problem with microloans, which is that many people end up poorer than they were before. Mm. So um, we uh, have done this. It's been remarkably successful, kind of stunningly successful. Um, what but the, I, you know, like I'll give you an example. So I was sitting with one man and his wife who were gonna start a chicken business. And this is a region that has about 20,000 people in it. And I said, okay, so where do people uh, buy chickens now? Well, they have to drive to Sukadana. I'm like, that's an hour and a half away. And they're like, yep, that's the closest place you can buy chickens. For a population of 20,000 people? Yeah, there's nowhere you can buy chickens. So I'm like, why has no one started a chicken, you know, like just growing chickens and selling the meat, right? Why has no one started that? because they don't have the $800 startup mm. costs that that took, right? No one did. And of course, this business, so the husband was growing the chickens uh, and then the wife had a, had a bicycle and a box on the back of the bicycle with a, you know, a igloo in the back. And then she would bicycle around with her ice and her chicken and, and sell all the meat. And it was wildly successful. So those are the kinds of uh, businesses that people people are starting and, and it's worked very, very well. I think we've had one or two loggers go back to logging. I think you, you, you touched on something which is really important is that for some of these communities and some of these individuals, they have been logging since they were essentially children. So yeah. it is very much probably even intergenerational. So it's oh, very yeah, much for kind sure. of built into their institutional mindset of my worth, how I provide it you know, income and, 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 and uh, yeah. you know, basic needs for my family and myself. So to switch that mental model with something else and recognizing that, again, their level of education may not be in par with other, you know, developing or developed nations. I'm just trying to figure out, like, would, would they run out of businesses to come up with that they can actually operationalize with their capabilities? We haven't run out of businesses yet. And in fact, I mean, you know, I, I thought that 
most of them would not be successful. Then we're going to have to figure out what to do at that point. But they're essentially all successful Mm. because there's no startup capital in these areas, Mm. right? And so, you know, little cafes on the beach and and barber shops and, you know, like just real basic stuff. But it's, and it's helping lift the entire economy. It's, yeah, I, I don't, I'm surprised too that it was so successful, but it really has been. I want to talk about results because there's a, a lot of um, data uh, and impact data that, that you have as an organization have, have uh, tracked for some time longitudinally, uh, whether it's, uh, again, we talked about Indonesia, Madagascar, Brazil, uh, and parts maybe even chi- in China as well. What are some of the impact that your organization, Health and Harmony, has specifically helped with? that ties back to climate change and climate action. Yeah, so the amount of carbon in the national park where we work first is equivalent to 14 years of carbon emissions from San Francisco, right? This is not a small amount of carbon these communities are protecting. In the Shingu Basin where we're working, that area is the size of the UK and all forest. And there are 20,000 people in that forest protecting it. These are some of the most important people on the planet. And I don't know if people are really aware of how important the rainforests are. If these forests have so much carbon in them that if they are cut down or burned, it is really game over for the human species because of that much carbon being released into the atmosphere. But The other thing about these trees is they're not only like holding, storing carbon, they're also continuing to suck down carbon from the atmosphere. One third of the pollution that humans emit every year is absorbed by forests around the world. We are all interconnected in this. And when we look at the earth as a single ecosystem, our rainforests are some of the most, are really the most important ecosystems, I would say. In the triage of the planet as a physician, you know, working on planetary health, that's what I have to think of, right? And, um, and these forests are also absolutely essential for water cycling around the earth. So I live in California. There have been horrible fires in recent years. And a lot of that is because of very bad drought here. But we never think about the fact that the drought is caused partly because of a loss of rainforest in the Amazon. The trees themselves produce rain locally and globally. And so these forests, they're just essential for the stabilization of the health of the entire planet. People talk about them as the heart of the planet, they're the lungs, in the sense they're kind of both. And, um, and then, of course, there's 50% of the world's biodiversity is in these forests. And biodiversity is super important because um, as the earth changes, and we've got some locked in climate change, right? We're not getting out of it. Um, more biodiverse ecosystems can um, compensate better and handle changes in temperature or in rainfall, et cetera. So, That's also another important reason for protecting the ecosystems. And then, you know, that last point of the justice crisis, right? These communities um, have been on the short end of the stick and for a very long time on the, in the planetary scale. And, and now they need to have resources flow back to them because they are providing an incredibly important service for the planet. For those that are listening that are not directly interfacing with health and harmony because they're not the target segment, they're not the indigenous peoples in these local communities, those that are living in North America, uh, in Europe, and other developed or developing nations, how should they be rationalizing this, both from a consumer point of view, but also from a philanthropic and, and donation perspective? Yeah, well... Please partner with these communities. We would be so honored. Go to healthandharmony.org um, and partner with the communities. There's so much we can do together. But also do think about what you are buying and what you're eating. 
you know, reducing meat is also a huge benefit to the planet. If you'd like to know more about all of this too, you can check out my book. Um, I just recently published it called Guardians of the Trees. It's a story of, it's a memoir. It's a story of personal healing, community healing, and global healing. And the fact that there is hope. We can do this. We can do it if we do it together. Well, I have been joined by Dr. Canary Webb, founder of Health and Harmony. Thank you for joining today. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.